The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, God's Sufficiency. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for all thy grace to us. Bless thy word as it goes forth, and use it to open the eyes of the blind, to strengthen thy children, to build us in the knowledge of Christ. We ask it through the merits of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his name's sake. Amen. We are studying together in Romans 8, 14, led by the Spirit of God. For 40 years, God led his people through the wilderness from Egypt to the promised land. He took every care of them. Their shoes did not wear out. Their clothes did not become old. They were provided with manna and quail and with water from the rock. Every circumstance of the journey brought out the worst in them for they were crossed in their own wills in order to learn that their way was worthless and that God's way was the only perfect way. But not only did the guiding cloud reveal to this people the true nature of their evil heart of unbelief and the wickedness of their own evil desires, it also showed them what they should be as those who had been chosen by God for his purposes. The Lord was revealing his presence to them every step of the way, and in every halt also. The cloud of glory was there as the symbol of his presence, even as the Holy Spirit is present in our lives to reveal the grace of God in every phase. Surely the task that God had set for himself was the most astounding in the history of his dealings with mankind. The desert journey revealed that there was no limit whatsoever to his power whether that power was needed to subdue their enemies or whether it was needed to supply their creature wants. What should have been their attitude in the face of such power and supply? Was it not meant to teach them the highest gratitude that they should be the objects of such love and care? Should they not have realized that they could commit themselves to him without any concern with the certain knowledge that he would most surely bring to pass that which he had begun for them. At the Red Sea, their souls were lifted for a moment when they saw their deliverance from the cruel hands of the Egyptians. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the chariot he has thrown into the sea. This was the song of Moses at the Red Sea and the song of the children of Israel. And they continued, The Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. There for a moment the people lived up to the obligations of the splendor and majesty which had been wrought in their behalf. Great grace demands great praise. Great deliverance demands great rejoicing. They should have continued this song for forty years. The fact that they stopped singing and started murmuring was part of their defeat. Oh, if they had only learned the lesson which was wrapped in that guiding cloud, then they could have sung day by day, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, terrible in majestic deeds, doing wonders? Now we commit the young men of our nation to the authority of our armed forces, and these men surrender themselves to the orders of their superiors in perfect confidence. They may not argue, though they may complain among themselves. They must do what they're told to do. It is galling to the flesh to go through strenuous drill routine, and muscles that are unaccustomed to certain exercises find it grievous to go on long route marches with sixty pounds of gear on the back. But the soldiers who do any thinking soon realize that they are being turned from boys into men. They must become aware that their flabbiness is giving away to hardness, and that they will face their foes in the hours of danger as conditioned warriors and not as awkward fledglings. Oh, if we would only learn from the leadings of our God that he is preparing us for himself in much the same way that a soldier must be conditioned by all his training. 
As the cloud set out and then stopped, because of all the unpredictable nature of its movements, they had to learn that God wanted them to be entirely at his disposal. They should have come to realize that they were completely under orders and that they were not to be consulted by God in anything. They were to find their joy in readiness and to understand that his ways are ways of pleasantness and that all his paths are peace. They were to find that God wanted to form their minds in such a way that they would take it as a matter of course that they were to trust and obey. The cloud was there to be followed. They had no other duty. When the cloud stopped, they could do what they pleased. It was only when the cloud moved that they were to move with it. They were to learn that the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. For many years I have loved that verse and always wondered what the second half of it meant. In our King James translation it is printed, and he delighteth in his way. But I did not know whether it was meant that he, the good man, delights in God's way, or that he, God, delighted in the way of the justified man. The New Revision puts it, and he, capital H, establishes him, small h, in whose way he delights. In other words, God establishes the believer in whose way he delights. I believe that the truth may lie in both readings of the verse. Certainly the Lord does establish the man who has been justified and who is following the divine leading. Blessed is such a man. He does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffer. The Lord makes the life of such a man to be like that of a planted tree. Whatsoever he doeth, shall prosper. But it is also true that the man who has learned to follow the guiding cloud, always ready to move when it moves, is the man who has come to delight in the way of the Lord. What the cloud was to them, the Holy Spirit is to us. He leads us because we have become the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That the experience of the cloud was not to be confined to the generation in the wilderness is evident from one of the great prophecies of Isaiah. For looking down through the years to the end of this age, when the chosen people shall have been regathered and planted in the land, we read in Isaiah, In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and glory of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Every one who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the blood stains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning, then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day and smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy and a pavilion. It will be for a shade by day from the heat and for a refuge and a shelter from the storm and rain. This is the fourth of Isaiah. Now we know that that passage is prophetic and concerns the guidance and blessing of his people Israel in the last day. Surely then what he has performed in the past and what he promises for the future is available for us at present. And our text in Romans confirms this truth. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We may learn from this that our expectation is in Him and can know just what we may expect from a kind Heavenly Father who has given us His Holy Spirit to be our guide and counselor. Could it be that there was any mercy given to His ancient people that He would withhold from us now that Christ has died? Do we not rather read that he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not rather with him freely give us all things? Have we not been told to praise him, saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus? As we are led of the Holy Spirit, 
we cannot be led in any direction other than the direction of God's will. As we are led of the Holy Spirit, we cannot be surrounded with anything other than the mercies of God. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the Lord will be with us and stand between us and the reality of death which he took when he died for us upon the cross. As we are led by the Spirit, we must be careful not to form wrong ideas concerning the rewards of our faithfulness here and now. This is not the age of material blessings, although there are times when God, in his special grace, has been pleased to give us material things in addition to the spiritual. I have known believers who live in the United States of America who have fallen into the error of thinking that nice cars, good homes in nice suburbs, refrigerators and television sets, and all such material things were a part of the Christian life for all believers. Such is not the case. The believers living under conditions that are little short of famine are much closer to what we might call the normal life of the believer during this present age. I was once told by a certain Christian that we could be certain that atomic bombs could not fall upon our cities today because the church is not to pass through the great tribulation. I replied that while I know that the Bible teaches that we shall be removed from this earth before the great tribulation comes to this earth, the Lord himself definitely announced that in this world ye shall have tribulation. The faith of Christian believers in England did not keep them from the horrors of the bombing of London, although they were kept in the midst of that bombing from any disturbance of heart, even though they themselves were wounded or killed, or even though, which was worse, they saw close loved ones killed before their eyes. Oh, we in America must learn not to think that the life which we live, with all of its material blessings, is the normal life of this age. Rarely have believers throughout the past 2,000 years been accorded the marvelous common grace of so many material blessings. And if we misuse those blessings, we may be sure that we shall be held doubly accountable before God. This is the age in which the Holy Spirit leads the sons of God by faith and not by sight. The cloud is not above us in the visible heavens, but within our hearts, and it is to bring its glory into every part of our lives, even as the ancient temple was filled with the smoke of the glory. God is not going to guide us by any means that will be obvious to the senses. We are not as donkeys before whose noses one must hold a carrot on a string, nor are we as donkeys underneath whom one must build a fire, nor are we as donkeys who must be beaten with clubs. But it is true that the Lord does show us in our lives the joy that is set before us, and we may move towards that joy if we are yielded to him. We are to be led by God, and we do learn that there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We must sing, however, but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. And we can be sure also that his love is so great that he will not hesitate to chastise us when it is for our own good, to discipline us, in order that we may not find our own ways and walk in our own thorny paths. And if necessary, the Lord will remove from us, even by fire and destruction or by death, anything that we have set our hearts upon as idols that could keep us from the full vision of his glory. The Spirit will never lead us apart from the word of God, and he will always lead us towards the accomplishment of everything that is in the word of God. If we seek to be led by impulses, dreams, visions, or anything else that is of the emotions or the senses, we shall find ourselves in the valley of delusion. This is the age of the word of God and the age of the Holy Spirit leading us by that word. We cannot underline this truth too strongly. 
Very frequently I have had people come to me with a desire to tell me about some supposed dream or vision which they thought that they had had from the Lord. In all cases I have said to them, now your vision might come from one of three sources. It might be from the devil, in which case you certainly wouldn't want to talk about it. It might come from some hallucination of your senses, in which case you certainly wouldn't want to talk about it. Now, if, if it came from God, and I always let them know that I doubt this most strongly, if, if it came from God, you should treat it like Paul treated his vision in which he saw things not lawful for a man to utter. And so I conclude, please do not utter it to me. Simeon of Cambridge said, the way by which the Holy Spirit will guide us is this. He will sanctify the dispositions and desires of our souls and thus enable us to discern good from evil and light from darkness. He will give us a single eye and then our whole body will be filled with light. Then we shall be prepared to understand the word and be enabled and inclined to follow it. And in this way, he will fulfill his promise that we shall hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. This is exactly what he has taught us to expect. The meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach his way. The judgment shall be rectified in the first instance by the influence of the Holy Spirit. And then shall the way of duty be made clear before our face. The word becoming not only a light to our feet, in general, but a lantern to our every step. Now, if we've understood that which has gone before, it will be easy for us to realize how we should seek to follow the leading which the Lord is providing for us. We should trust without worry. We should surrender without complaining, and we should obey without hesitation. We should trust without worry because worry in the light of the power and grace of God is not only ingratitude toward God, but it is an insult to his wisdom and goodness. In fact, trust and worry are total opposites and can no more exist together than can light and darkness. If we are truly trusting, worry is absolutely excluded. We cannot have a cup of milk and a cup of water in the same cup at the same time. Just as perfect love casteth out fear, so perfect trust casteth out worry. I early learned in my mathematics classes that if a given factor was subtracted from both sides of an equation, the result was still an equation. When we apply this mathematical truth to the spiritual realm, we have a great blessing. The Holy Spirit has taught the believer to say, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Now, if you subtract a little trust from each part of that equation, it leaves us with this result. Thou wilt keep him in half and half peace, whose mind is half and half stayed on thee because he half and half trusteth in thee. When we know that our times are in his hand and that he has promised to choose our inheritance for us, we may rest in the calm assurance that he doeth all things well, and we can live a life of trust without worry. Further, we should surrender without complaining. Paul told the Philippian church, do all things without murmurings and disputings. This was the word of the Holy Spirit. It is true that our little minds cannot understand all of the reasons for all of the choices of God. If we could understand God, we would be God. But it is not necessary that we understand. Those who live in a world of internal combustion engines without knowing the difference between a piston and a camshaft are not afraid to ride in automobiles or even to drive them. Those who live in a world of wings without understanding aerodynamics are not afraid to fly the ocean in an airplane. If then we trust in forces around us at every step of our lives, using telephones, cars, and appliances that we can neither understand nor repair, shall we not then trust in the living God and surrender ourselves to his guidance without complaint? We do not need to know as long as we know that he knows. We do not know what is in the future, but we do know who is in the future. He has told us that we do not know what he is doing now, 
but that we shall know hereafter. This should lead us to obedience without hesitation. It is not necessary that our flesh should be gratified by his commands. Indeed, if his ways were pleasing to our flesh, then his word about the nature of our flesh would be false. The flesh will always lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these two are contrary the one to the other. All we must know is the fact of his command. Then we should move forward without hesitation or reluctance. It may be that he will call us to move in the darkness. As long as his light is ahead, we can go forward. It may be that he shall keep us toiling in the rowing, but we can be sure that he will come to us in the darkest watch of the night. It may be that we shall be called upon to fight the dread battle of loneliness and pain and to lie inactive through years of suffering. We can rest quietly in the fact that he is in it all with us and can give him our heart's love. Writing on Israel's journey, Simeon summed it up as follows. In a word, to be continually with him, enjoying his presence, fulfilling his will, and pressing forward to his glory, this is the Christian's duty. This is the very end of his redemption and the way to his inheritance. Consider yourselves now in, in the state of Israel advancing through the wilderness and expect that as God's children you shall be led by his Holy Spirit. Yet be careful not to expect more than God has promised. Do not suppose that you shall be so led as to be kept from all error. It is not God's design to render any man infallible or so to guide him that he shall have no ground for fear and self-distrust. We must, under all circumstances, feel a godly fear lest Satan should take advantage of us, or our own deceitful hearts should beguile us. The Israelites, though under the cloud, fell short of the promised land because their hearts were not right with God, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But if you will follow the Lord fully, you may look up to him with holy confidence that now, even now, he will guide you by his counsel and hereafter he will receive you to glory. And our God and Father, we pray thee that the Holy Spirit shall bless the word to every heart in this hour. And unto thee be the glory and the majesty, the dominion and the power, now and until the Lord Jesus come again and forever. Amen.